Right, I'm gonna mute. Yeah. Yep, and just had to find on. the just had to find the mute button. Sorry. <laughs> Slideshow. <laughs> Anytime now. Hi, uh, my name is Karen DeBose, and I'm Skagit County's Pollution Identification and Correction Coordinator. Um, that basically means I look for pollution in our water and work with partners to figure out ways to correct it. So um, I want you to know a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in a pretty urbanized area. Um, and our house backed up to this. It's it's what we called at the time the ditch. And I gotta say, it took an embarrassingly long time for me to realize that that was the creek. Um, it took about thirty years. It took about thirty years, and uh, living here instead to to discover to myself that this was a creek. It certainly did not look like my concept of a creek. Um, my concept of a creek came from spending my summers up in the Sierras, um, camping, hiking. That's where I started to learn a lot more about the natural world. And that's where my defi definition of creek and natural waters came from. Um, and that's where I developed a pretty strong interest in protecting the natural world. But I didn't really understand the connection between me and my everyday personal actions and the impact of those actions on the world around me. Oops, excuse me until um, I moved here, um, living in a place where nature is so obviously integrated into everything um, in all but the most urban places, really made me realize the connection between the two. Um, that and the fact that everything seems to grow here, of course, sparked an interest in gardening. Um, my mom and I got super interested in gardening and making sure that what we did in our yards wasn't damaging the world around us. Um, these photos are from my mom's garden. They stayed, it, it was uh, a blank space, you know, just complete dirt 15 years ago. And it's been through quite a number of iterations since then. Um, this is not actually the current iteration. This is about three years ago. Um, but, but we've, of all the things that we've done and changed, we've really kept that commitment to keeping our garden as light on the environment surrounding us as possible. And even with that, we still managed to grow the most enormous carrots that I have ever seen in my life using these practices. So um, just like two of those carrots was a whole pot of soup for me for a week. <laughs> so, so we do pretty well. Um, and oh, I gotta get that straightened out. I'm gonna use my keyboard instead. So when I'm not in the garden, um, I work for Skagit County's clean water program. And again, working to keep pollution out of our streams and lakes and marine waters. Our goal is to make sure that our waters are safe for everyone, no matter what you're here doing. Um, if your kids are out in the, you know, in their your neighbor's yard playing in the creek, if you're out at the beach playing in the water, if you're eating shellfish that are harvested here, we want to make sure that you go home healthy and happy. And so um, that's what our goal is. We monitor for um, a number of water quality parameters. Uh, the core of our water quality monitoring program is what you see here. Um, we're actually pretty limited in what we can monitor for because a lot of the cool tests that we would all like to see, like what's, what kind of pesticides are in our waters, what kind of uh, heavy metals or pollution from cars are there. Um, those are all very, very expensive tests. But what we do measure um, helps to tell us what might be there. Um, Temperature and dissolved oxygen, turbidity, pH, and conduct conductivity uh, are all measures of things that tell us whether the water is um, safe or a good environment for mostly fish to live in, but anything that lives in the water from the little stream bugs that are in there to the, you know, anybody, anybody that lives in the water, um, especially dissolved oxygen. There's no oxygen, there's no, there's no life in the water. So, um, we measure fecal bacteria because we are more interested in um, human, human issues for there. Um, fish don't care about if there's poop in the water. In fact, um, you know, maybe it, it feeds the little bugs or something like that. But we care if there's poop in the water because we don't want to go home with norovirus or E. coli or any other kind of nasty diseases. Um, and we monitor nutrients because we're interested in finding out whether fertilizers that we're using in our lawns and gardens are washing into our waters and then causing toxic algae blooms. Um, any algae bloom, not all algae blooms are toxic, but um, we're starting to see a lot more toxic algae blooms um, lately. 
So let's talk really quick about how pollution gets in the water. I think um, unless you're like me and this is your business, um, we often think that pollution happens when someone intentionally or unintentionally spills a pollutant directly into the water. For example, somebody emptying their RV um, septic tank directly into the river. Um, and yes, that does happen, um, has happened. But the most common way that pollution gets into the water is actually driven by rain. Um, all kinds of pollutants are being deposited on the landscape at all times. That can be fertilizers that didn't quite land where they were supposed to, like in the middle picture here, uh, spills on pavement that didn't get cleaned up, cars dripping fluids, and a whole lot more. When it rains, the rainwater picks up that water or picks up those pollutants um, and carries it to the nearest creek or ditch. In two of these photos, you can see catch basins. And a lot of people think that the water that goes into those catch basins is treated in some way. And in the vast majority of cases, that is not true. Those catch basins flow directly to the nearest waterway, be it a ditch or the creek. Um, the outfall can look like this. And so, um, even if we could somehow treat the water coming out of catch basins, removing pollutants from water is very difficult and very expensive. Um, if you pay a sewer, if you pay a sewer bill, excuse me, um, think about how much that costs every year, how much you're paying in a sewer bill every year. And many people are surprised to learn that sewage treatment usually only removes solids and pathogens from the water. It's not designed to remove dish soap that goes down the, down the drain, um, any of those other things that go down the drain, including pharmaceutical chemicals that may be uh, coming out in your urine, or maybe you flushed down the toilet. Please don't flush your medication down the toilet. Um, just kind of all those household products go down the drain and sewage treatment is not designed to remove those things. It's very, very expensive. So the, really the best way to keep our water clean is to make sure that pollution never gets there in the first place. So jumping into what you can do, um, the previous pre presentation discussed pest management and perhaps you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna get rid of some of my chemicals. So let's talk about pesticides and herbicides and any other hazardous waste you might have around the house. Um, basically, if you're wondering if it's hazardous waste, look for the words danger, caution, or warning or something similar to that on the label. And that's, that's your big clue that what you have is hazardous waste. And there's a surprising number of things, including the bleach, you know, in your, in your laundry cabinet that are hazardous waste. So um, this is actually a picture of a shelf in my garage. We all have that shelf in the garage or in the shed that looks like this, a random collection of stuff from your car or your garden, maybe some paint, some burnt out fluorescent bulbs. Um, landfills don't want this stuff because landfills can leak and we know that. And we don't want a bunch of horrible hazardous chemicals leaching out into our waterways, into our soils. And it's pretty obvious um, why, but just to make sure it's really clear to, that it's important to keep these hazardous chemicals out of the water because they're very toxic to creatures out there and not just you and me. Um, this adorable little caddis fly um, may one day be food for a juvenile salmon and the salmon may one day get eaten by an orca. And so if we care about orcas, we need to care about the little bugs like this. And caddis flies, especially including stone, fl stone flies, a, a bunch of the bugs in the water are super, super sensitive to very, very low levels of hazardous chemicals. And so um, if we you know, accidentally kill all the bugs in our streams, we're actually contributing to starving our salmon, our orcas and everything else. So we really want to be very, very careful about managing our hazardous chemicals and making sure they get the place they need to be. The good news is that Skagit County offers free disposal of hazardous waste. Uh, we accept up to 25 gallons, which is rather a lot of hazardous waste, uh, per household per month. So you can bring us an awful lot of hazardous waste. Uh, we have a huge list of what we can accept and our hours and locations on the website at skagitcounty.net slash hazardous waste, or sorry, has waste. Um, so do check that for locations and details. And I believe Carla attached a flyer to her email um, that I put together that has links to all these resources. So don't, don't worry about trying to scribble it down right now. 
So moving on and keeping with that kind of garden theme, um, the clean water program cares about fertilizer because when it's used incorrectly, it can cause algae blooms, including the toxic algae blooms that you hear about in the news that kill dogs. Uh, we had a toxic algae bloom last year um, over at Lake Erie, one of the lakes over by Anacortes um, that actually killed a whole lot of bats. Um, so, you know, wildlife, it's not just the dogs that get killed, it's wildlife, anything else that's coming into contact with that water. Um, so that's, that's just really bad news. Um, a lot of the lakes in our region actually have natural conditions that leave them already prone to algae blooms. So if there is any more fertilizer that's coming from our yards that's being put in, that just makes the problem a lot worse and makes tox toxic algae blooms a lot more likely to happen. Um, I really like the photo on the right because it shows two things that we really care about. The toxic blue-green algae is that beautiful kind of swirly, it's re it really is a beautiful thing to look at, um, that swirly kind of looks like spilled paint. Um, and also invasive weeds. Many lakeside communities are spending thousands of dollars trying to manage the invasive weed situation in the lake. And if fertilizer is coming off of your property, you're just fertilizing the weeds that you're also trying to kill at the same time. So lakeside properties, um, if you're near a lake especially, it's just really important to keep managing your fertilizer. So there's some tips I wanna share. Um, it's really important to make sure you're only using fertilizer where it's needed and when the plants can use it. So our tip number one, is do not ever fertilize in winter, just don't do it. Your lawn and your plants are not growing then and what doesn't get used is probably just gonna wash away in the winter rains. So you'll have wasted all the time and the effort and you'll have polluted the water. So no fertilizing in winter ever. Um, second, we always recommend that you get a soil test before you do anything. They're about $20, they don't cost that much. There's a lab in Burlington that you can use. I put the, the resources for all the labs that are around um, on that handout. And those soil tests can, can tell you what you need. Um, if you have the opportunity to ask for uh, the, the interpreted results, most of the labs will actually interpret the results for you um, for free or like $5 or something like that. Um, so make sure you get those results interpreted. Soil is a lot like a sponge. There's only so much space in it to hold nutrients. And so if you're applying more nutrients than that soil can store or that the plant can use at that time right away, those nutrients are just gonna wash away in the next rainstorm. So you'll have wasted all that effort, like going and getting the fertilizer, lugging these big heavy bags around, um, you know, putting it down in our creeks and our lakes and our marine areas are gonna be more prone to algae blooms. So um, definitely get a soil test um, and know what your soil says, uh, what it needs. We also recommend, and your soil test would probably tell you this, um, that you avoid products with phosphorus unless your soil test says you need it. Our native soils are naturally already high in, in phosphorus, so you're not likely to need it unless perhaps you're in intensively farming your property. Um, so, so keeping extra phosphorus, especially out of the water is one of our priorities because it's the main culprit in freshwater algae blooms. Um, in marine waters, nitrogen is the culprit. But um, yeah, in, in our lakes and our creeks and things, phosphorus is the main culprit. So if you can avoid phosphorus in your fertilizers, all the better. Uh, let's see, slow release fertilizers. So we always recommend slow release fertilizers, um, whether it's organic or not, I promise I will never judge you for using uh, a, an inorganic fertilizer versus an organic fertilizer. What I care about is you reading the instructions and you getting a soil test and using the fertilizer correctly. Uh, slow release is really important because it feeds your plants slowly instead of all at once and then starving when there's the food is all used up. Um, and it also means that you're out there applying fertilizer a lot less often. I, I don't know anybody who really enjoys um, fertilizing the lawn all the time. Uh, so, so a slow release one is, is a much better uh, option. You'll have more time in your life to do the fun things rather than fertilize. 
And last but not least, um, for the lawn especially is grass cycling. Grass cycling is an option that allows you to skip most or all of fertilizing for your grass. When you leave the grass clippings on the lawn, they'll slowly break down and feed the lawn just like a slow release fertilizer would. So it's just it's just creating a circle, um, circle of life. It's a circle of nutrients in your lawn. Um, they'll help build the soil too, which also increases the soil's water holding capacity, and then you're going to spend less money watering your lawn. And last but not least, please, please, please sweep up any spills or any fertilizer that didn't make it onto the grass. Um, this is a spill I saw last year in my neighborhood that just really frustrated me because just at the bottom of this slope is a catch basin and there's a creek that that catch basin pours directly into. And this is, uh, you know, like really quite a lot of fertilizer that just got left there. Um, all of it washed right into that creek the next day when it rained. And so really cleaning up those spills and making sure that fertilizer gets where it's supposed to be is just a, is such an important detail. So let's talk about poop. Everybody um, loves talking about poop, right? Um, I always joke that my career is literally crap because um, I, I most of my job is actually figuring out where poop is coming from in the, in the water and fixing it. So um, here in Skagit County, we're concerned about that because, you know, just like I had said, our goals, we want people to come here and not go home sick from eating shellfish, from playing in, in your backyard creek. Um, we, we, we just really, we have a, we have a huge amount of shellfish harvesting areas too. So it really matters to our economy when those shellfish, har shellfish harvesting areas, um, especially in Sandwich Bay get shut down because of pollution. Uh, it's, it's really a big deal. And there's a surprising number of waterways in Skagit County that are listed by the Washington Department of Ecology for high levels of fecal bacteria. And so um, there's a lot of suspects here. Um, they, you know, everything, everybody poops, all the mammals, including birds, um, are out there pooping. And so I wanted to talk really briefly about the major sources that we find. Um, farms, uh, pasture management specifically, but um, farms are a possible uh, source of pollution. Uh, most of us are probably not gonna have farm animals, but in case you do or know somebody who does, um, pasture management is just really critical to making sure that your farm is efficient, that you're not dealing with a whole bunch of mud, that your animals are healthy, um, and, and keeping our environment clean. So what you see here is, um, a pretty common situation, actually. You see a bunch of cows standing in a muddy area. They're busy pooping. They're stomping all over that. They're mixing the mud in with manure. And then the next rain comes and washes it into the, the ditch, the roadside ditch that's running right there in the front of the picture. And then that runs to the Samish River. Um, and then that runs on top of shellfish beds. And so um, we are working very hard to change situations like this, to teach people about better pasture management, how they can grow more grass and save themselves money in vet bills by choosing better pasture management. I'm here. So septic systems is one of our next, um, you know, humans, human poop is something that if, you know, if you're exposed to human poop, you're, you're likely to get sick from that. And so um, I wanted to talk about a couple of major septic system type failure types that we see. And one of those is a direct pipe to the creek. So this pipe um, actually came from a septic system. Sometimes we stumble across really old houses that just never had a septic system in the first place. Sometimes we stumble across um, a situation where, uh, you know, a septic system used to be there, but the drain field failed and somebody didn't want to replace it. And so they just decided to run a pipe directly to the nearest ditch or creek. And so we spend an awful lot of time trying to find those problems and fix them. Um, yeah. Another type of septic system failure is actually when the drain field fails. And um, I always, you know, people always think that a drain field, um, not that a drain field, I, I've, I, I keep hearing, I'll know if my septic system has failed because it's going to back up into my house. 
And the most frequent kind of septic system failure is actually in the drain field. And so if you're not spending time in your yard, um, you may not see this. This property owner didn't see this problem. We saw it from the road. And so um, it's just it's just good to keep in mind that that drain fields are actually where all the treatment happens. Um, that's where the water is cleaned. It's not in the septic tank, it's in the drain field. So if there's a problem with the drain field, you're basically just polluting your neighbor's property, your property. Um, it's not a really great situation. So the third type of problem that we're finding is uh, illegal discharges from RVs. So a trailer or something like that that is not connected to a septic system in any way. Um, Sometimes, you know, they pull off the side of the road and just dump where they are. Sometimes there are RVs that don't move, that just aren't discharged into a septic system or into the sewage treatment plant. Um, most of the time, this is really hard for us to find. So if you see something like this, um, we would really appreciate if you would take photos and um, including any license plates, if there's any license plates um, and let us know as soon as possible. So some solutions for septic system problems, um, just understanding how your septic system works is really, really critical. Um, understanding that you can't just, you know, like I can't, I live uh, in the city, so I'm on sewer. I can do all the laundry I want all at the same time and it's not gonna cause a problem. You can't do that with septic systems. So understanding how your septic system works and what it can take and what it can't is really, really critical. Getting your septic system inspected or getting trained to do it yourself is really important. Septic systems are required to be inspected every one to three years. And it's important to keep on that schedule because if there's a problem if, and you don't get it inspected, you might not catch that problem. And then the problem gets worse and then maybe you have to replace your whole septic system. So um, it's sometimes $150 inspection can save you $30,000 $30, in replacement. So it's really, really important to, to keep on your inspections. Um, and then last but not least, if you see something that seems not quite right, please do let us know sooner rather than later. There's nothing worse for us than getting a report of something that sounds really important. And I've had these calls, oh, there was a guy and he was dumping sewage in the ditch last month. Well, I, I can't do anything about that. You don't have a picture of it. I have no way to prove um, what's happened. And so um, please, please include photos about what you saw and let us know right away. Um, photos especially help us prioritize where to go and, and we can check it out. So dogs, um, this is my friend's dog, Jack. Jack has a lot more energy than Mitzi now who is uh, sleeping behind me, Mitzi's 15. But um, dogs are wonderful and they are very good dogs and they poop an awful lot. And a surprising number of people don't pick up after their dogs in their own yards. Most people actually will pick up after their dogs on a dog walk, but they won't pick up in their own yards. Or if they do, they toss that poop over the fence or in a corner of their yard where they're, they're not hanging out. Um, and that's all a really huge problem because all of that poop just sitting on the landscape um, really, really creates a problem. Dog poop can take a year or more to just uh, to degrade. And it can include a lot of diseases that um, the dog can actually give itself. So, you know, if your dog maybe is sick with tapeworms or, you know, or something, you can take your dog for a, a treatment at the vet, take care of that. And then, you know, a couple of months later, your dog is sick again. And that's because all of that poop is just sitting there in the yard and your dog is constantly re-exposing itself. So um, it's really important for the health of your dog. And it's also important for our waters because, and this was just really astonishing to me, we did a little bit of DNA testing in the waters in some, several of our problem areas uh, last year. And what shocked me, like absolutely shocked me, was that we found dog poop in every single creek that we looked in. Um, and I was just astonished. We were looking for cow and ruminant and human and dog DNA. And we found cow here and there, human here and there, um, ruminants, you know, here and there, but dog poop was found at every single site. And that was just really astonishing to me because these sites were in areas 
that people don't walk. They're very rural areas, so they're not walking their dog on the road because they'll get run over if they walk their dog on the road. Um, there's no parks nearby, so it's definitely people not cleaning up after their dogs on walks. And then the rain hits, and that all just washes into the nearest creek. So um, please, please scoop the poop in your yard. Um, please do not put it in the compost. Um, or, or in your yard waste bin. Bagging it and trashing it, as much as we all hate plastic, bagging and trashing it is, is the best option and the healthiest option. So you hear me talk about dogs and you're like, oh, my, my one dog can't be that big of a deal. And so I really enjoy um, telling people about um, the, the scale here. Um, and there's a surprising number of scientific articles out there that actually measure how much fecal coliform are produced by each kind of animal. And uh, it's pretty astonishing to discover that sheep are pretty much the most disgusting creature. <laughs> Those adorable little sheep. Um, a lot of people like to blame the beavers um, in the water and beavers are in the water and they do poop. However, um, I am much more concerned about a herd of sheep next to the river than one beaver in the river, um, just because the, the sheer magnitude of the bacteria that they can produce each day is really um, impressive. And a lot of people are saying to me, oh, my one dog isn't that big of a deal, but your one dog is like two humans pooping in your yard. And so um, that's a pretty significant amount of bacteria that's being created in just one average dog. So moving on from the poop subject, um, I would like to talk for a few minutes about car washing, not necessarily a backyard gardening sort of thing, but something that you might be doing in your driveway. Um, so this, this photo, I always feel like it's a little corny, but it, it is very instructive. Um, if you're washing your car on your paved driveway and that water is running off into the nearest waterway, um, that's not, that's not good. There's a lot of really nasty stuff that's on cars, um, between the road grime and maybe bits of asphalt, dirt, brake dust. None of that is good for our creeks. And neither is the soap that you're using to wash your car. So when you wash your car, if you choose to do it on your own um, property, we would prefer that you do it on uh, somewhere where that water can filter into the water, into the, the ground. So washing your car on your lawn, washing it on maybe a gravel driveway where the water can percolate into the soil is great. Commercial car washes are my favorite option. Um, they have to filter water before it leaves their site. And they can actually reuse that water because they filtered it so well. So it's, a, it's really a nice option and probably the most, if you're looking for the most environmentally friendly option, a commercial car wash is probably your best choice there. And then please don't drip and drive, just don't do it. Um, collectively, cars in the Puget Sound region leak an oil tanker's um, worth, uh, a tanker truck's worth of fluids every single day. And that's an awful lot of oil that's ending up in Puget Sound. And so um, Puget Sound Partnership has actually, um, or the Puget Sound Starts Here campaign, all the stormwater programs in, in the Puget Sound area are really pushing on this message of, of just don't drip and drive. If you, um, have a leak and you're not sure what it is, you can go to fixcarleaks.org and there's a really nice chart that talks about the different colors of things that kind of come out of your car. So you can try to diagnose what the problem is, where it's coming from in your car. Um, and if you can't afford to fix car leaks, because we do realize that car leaks, you know, can be expensive to fix, at the very least, we'd like you to put cardboard or something absorbent under that car so that when it's parked overnight, those leaks are captured and not end up flowing directly into the catch basin like what's happening with this van. Um, it's, yeah, every time, I, every time I go to a parking lot and it's raining, I see situations like this and it, it really is difficult because that is flowing directly into a ditch, which is flowing into a creek, which is flowing into the river. So um, don't trip and drive. And last but not least for vehicles, it's making sure your tires are always inflated properly. 
Um, I don't know if you've heard in the news that salmon in our streams are dying be before they even have the chance to spawn. So they're living their whole lives out in the out in the ocean. They come back to spawn and something in the water kills them before they get the chance to spawn. And a whole lot of years of research has shown that it's very specifically a chemical in our tires that is the culprit. So um, now that we know that, the tire companies are working to find a replacement for that chemical, but that's honestly gonna take years to, for them to figure out. Um, so the best thing that we can do is reduce the wear on our tires. So no rabbit starts, you know, no, no fast starts and hard brakes, um, keeping those tires inflated to manufacturer standards, um, just, you know, those general things that will keep your tires lasting longer and that'll save you money too, conveniently. So I wanna offer some resources. Um, we have, uh, if you're interested in any of the bacteria situations, if you know somebody who has a farm or if you have a septic system or you just generally want to know more about the bacteria situation, we have our PoopSmart campaign website at poopsmart.org. Um, there is a whole lot of information there. What we're trying to do there is connect you to resources that will help you figure out where your septic system is, figure out who to inspect, you know, who you can get to inspect it, um, figure out, you know, what resources are out there to help farmers. And by the way, if you do know a farmer or are a farmer and would like some resources, the Skagit Conservation District is the perfect place to, to get those connections. And so Carla is actually, Carla or Cindy or Taylor um, here on this call are, are really good resources for those things. Um, we are also on social media, so you can find us on Facebook at Skagit County Clean Water. We also post to Nextdoor if you're a Nextdoor follower. Um, and my favorite thing is our e-newsletter. Uh, we have a monthly e-newsletter that we send out that has tips on, oh gosh, all kinds of things. Um, you know, uh, we talk about hazardous waste, about fertilizers, about farms, just general living, about things that are going on um, in our natural resources division, the projects that we're doing, our restoration projects. We've shared some really cool projects that we've been working on. Um, and there's also a bunch of stewardship opportunities. So if you're interested in planting parties or helping, you know, restoration projects, um, all of those things are available on our e-newsletter. And like I said, it's a monthly e-newsletter, so I'm not going to harass you regularly, you know, any more than monthly. Um, and you can find that at our website at skagitcounty.net slash clean water. And with that, um, are there any questions? trying to unshare. Thank you, Karen. That was very awesome. Thank you. Still trying to unshare my screen. <laughs> All right. Any questions from the, the group? Yeah, it looks like we have a question. Um, on where to go for that training on the septic systems. Ah, yes, skagitcounty.net slash septic. And you could also just Google probably um, Skagit County Septic 101. We have two classes, 101 and 201. Um, they are both online. We got 201 online pretty quickly during the pandemic, so it's a little bit clunky. Um, but it's uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty good class, and if you are wondering um, about if you're feeling uncomfortable, let's say like if you're if you're taking the classes and you're really interested in doing it, but you're feeling uncomfortable and you want kind of somebody to come next to you and and you know do it with you to make sure that you're doing it right, um, give our septic program a call and they are happy to come out and, and join you on a septic inspection to make sure that you're doing it right. They're happy to do that. Would it be okay if I promote our uh, storm drain um, marking program where we have all the markers at our office for the city of Mount Vernon 
and the city of Burlington and Skagit County. And if anybody wants to mark their storm drains in their neighborhoods, I can hook them up. So just contact Cindy at skagitcd.org. Anything else? Any questions for Diana? She's still here. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> well, then I'm going to ask a question. I want to know how I've lived in this valley for my whole 57 years of my life. And all of a sudden, in the last mm, years, uh oh, <laughs> that we all the sudden have all these snails. Oh, I guess. Partly it's climate change. At least that's what I've heard. Is snails have their shell, and so they can withstand drier, hotter temperatures than slugs do. Slugs need moisture, but slugs can go down several inches. So, you know, cold weather doesn't bother slugs. Uh, they can go deep into the soil and sleep. It's not really a hibernation. It's sort of like going dormant in the soil. Uh, and there's, they bury their eggs. They lay their eggs in August and September. Sometimes the egg, eggs overwinter, sometimes they don't. We water our lawns and things more. They, they're very invasive they've taken over from the native slugs and the native slugs don't eat the non-native slugs. So, um, and they weigh, they can weigh like 500 eggs. That's a lot of eggs. Diana, I hardly have any slugs and that's all we used to have. Yeah, no, the snails, the snails. snails are really coming in more. So everybody says that they see more snails. Oh yeah. Around. Uh, and I know Absolutely. Snails, and snails are more visible. You know, you can have a lot of slugs and not even realize until you see the big ones. The leopard slug doesn't eat much vegetation. It eats other slugs. So it's, you know, king of the mountain kind of slug. So it's a good one to have, even though it's a, not a native slug. And it's one of our largest slugs. But there's, a, I was looking through and under some things the other day, and I saw a little, lots of little slugs, little tiny slugs that you don't even notice this time of year. Okay. Just was curious about that. Yeah. No, there's a lot of slugs out there, but that, the brown snail, which has come up from California, is a lot more noticeable. Well, I've noticed that I've got all different colors of snails. Oh, yeah. There's a, you know, some of the shells are like works of art. They're beautiful. Oh, absolutely. Beautiful. But still, uh, they're yeah. like my plants. So, well, encourage beetles and things like that. Okay. Are... Centipedes. Yeah. Okay. Centipedes. Bria and Bria. Do we have any more questions? Okay, uh, we have the question, how do you encourage beetles and centipedes? moist places for them to hide. For any wildlife you're trying to encourage, they need food, they need place to hide, they need nesting places. So if you keep your borders, your ground uh, spotless, no, no weeds or anything, you know, no leaf, dried leaves or wet leaves, things like that, you know, you're, you, they don't have the habitat that they need to hide, to, to nest, etc. cetera. So you, that's part of it is maybe not being such a neat gardener but allowing places for insects like beetles and centipedes um, to nest and lay eggs and thrive. They need this, moisture. Go ahead Virgin. This time of year there's a lot of them that are buried in the soil. There's a lot of beetles. I just found one the other day when I was weeding. I just put it right back because I figure he's tunneling through the soil looking for slug and snail eggs. Same thing with your centipedes. You see them more when the weather's nice and it's warm, but right now they're hiding, like you mentioned. Can I ask a question? Yes. 
Um, this is for Karen. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do with your kitties poop? Oh, you know, I keep forgetting to talk about cats. You're right. I got that question. I had a presentation yesterday and I had somebody ask the same question. So and that was um, me. I asked oh, that question. <laughs> <laughs> you must be tired of me by now. <laughs> My Thank voice you. is tired of me for sure. Um, so yeah, cats are, are really important because um, they carry toxoplasmosis and toxoplasmosis or they can carry, not every cat's going to carry it, right. but um, they can carry toxoplasmosis. And that is actually a disease that can kill uh, a lot of marine animals. So uh, it's well known to go after, um, oh my God, the cute fluffy ones. Um, not seals, not sea lions, river otters, the otters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and so sorry, it's, I've been up <laughs> since 5 a.m. So I'm a little tired. Um, so keeping that out of the water is really, really important. Um, we recommend that you put that kitty litter in the garbage um, in a plastic bag and seal it up as good as you can. Um, some people are interested in trying to flush cat poop and we don't recommend that because that sends it to the wastewater treatment plant and wastewater treatment does not necessarily kill every single last pathogen. And we really wanna keep that out of the marine waters. So um, you could flush dog poop if you were so inspired, um, if you were hoping to avoid plastic. Um, if you are on a septic system, I recommend you talk with your septic inspector because that's like adding a whole nother human to your, um, to your household and you're probably gonna have to pump your septic system more often. But if you're trying to avoid plastic, uh, my question is always, how are you gonna get it from your yard or from your walk to the toilet? Chances are good you're using plastic. So <laughs> chances are good I would be using plastic. So um, so again, you know, dog poop and, and cat poop, especially um, in, the, as much as I hate to say it, in, in the trash is the most important thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hey, you're welcome. Karen. It's Cindy again. Yeah. So I have a pet door. So my my dogs and cats go outside. And obviously my cats go and poo in the yard and bury it. Mm -hmm. So how do people combat that? <sighs> have an indoor cat? <laughs> <laughs> no, not happening on this property. Nope. I live in the country. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I mean, I would hope that if it's buried, then it's, you know, it's not making its way to the waterway. Um, but, but cats, cats are always a challenge because then there's the question of cats killing birds and, you know, all the, all the things and, uh, ooh, outdoor sandbox. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor is a genius. <laughs> my, my whole yard is an outdoor sandbox right now because we're building a shop. Trust me, it's an outdoor sandbox. Nice. Just get your little shovel out there and just shovel the whole area. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions for either me or Diana? If anybody needs any dog poo bags or any dog poo bag holders, please get a hold of the Skagit Conservation District and we'll hook you up. Yeah, we have a whole stash of them too at the county. So um, we will set you up. <laughs> And I may preface that the Skagit Conservation District is non-regulatory. Mm -hmm. And so if you guys have issues that you're seeing out there, the best place to contact is the county. And then the county will contact the Conservation District if they feel like that's something that can be handled um, non-regulatory where somebody's voluntarily um, letting you on the property to assess it. So it's kind of that, that kind of difference between the two.
All right. Claudia, Claudia, I put the conservation district's phone number in, in the chat box. Thank you so much. Excellent job, Diana and Karen. Yes. Thank you so nice. much. It was fun. It was my pleasure. Thank you for asking Master Gardeners to help. Yep. Always enjoy this stuff. <laughs> Anytime I can talk about poop because my career is crap. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> all right. If Well, if there's no more questions, we'll call it a wrap and I will right. get together all the information and send it out to yeah. you. Our, um, Thank you, everyone. Be Very careful nice. next week has a little project for you to do before next Wednesday. So I will send that information out for everyone and it will be Thanks. fun. I'm Thank sure you, Karen, for the great presentation. I learned a lot. It was very helpful. Yes. Oh, very nice. both, both of you guys were awesome. It was great. Bye bye. Super. Bye now. Bye. bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>